Hello and welcome to Health Policy uh, HCA 528 Week 3. So our agenda for today's discussion will be typically focusing on healthcare costs. We'll be talking about some contributing factors, items that have been, have been causing healthcare costs to rise more dramatically here than elsewhere. And uh, so they'll, they'll, they'll go through a number of items there. We have a YouTube video to, to this where there's some other folks uh, talking about it. And we'll also have the, the weekly discussions for this week. So let's talk a little bit about, about healthcare costs and what and why why they they become such a problem. So the United States has the most expensive healthcare system in the world. And if when you look at this chart in terms of our expenditures as a percentage of GDP, what you can see is that our expenses as a as a percent of GDP have, have, have are, are are rising close to 20%. That is a massive number. It is much, much higher than any other country in the world and will, in the long term, put us at a real disadvantage compared to every other country in the world. Because for every dollar that we spend in our economy, 20, about 20 cents of that dollar is going to go to health care, whether that is a car, whether that is a, whether that is a piece of fruit, whether it, is, whether it is a candy bar, a cup of coffee, it all goes into health care. And so that is a that is a massive drag on our economy going forward compared to other places in the world. So that's why it is very important that we get that we get a handle on this going forward. And we also, not only do we spend more than anybody else, we get less for it. So here, what you can see is we spend almost twice as much uh, per year on for, for healthcare in the United States than we do in other countries around the world. It, uh, certainly even the most, the, even the country closest to us spends almost half of what, of what we spend with Germany. They also have a very large and very active economy. And one of the things that you'll also see is that our, not only are we spending more, but even in spite of that, our life expectancy has actually been going down. And part, a large part of that has to do with the COVID pandemic, but there are also issues dealing with um, some, of, some of the chronic diseases that we're having within the United States that are also driving that. So we are spending more and we are getting less for it. So in, in addition, what we're seeing, and we talked about this in the session last week when we were talking about health insurance, our premiums and our premiums and deductibles are rising faster than the average person's take home uh, take home pay is, has been rising over the past over the past decade. So we're seeing increases in, 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 in premiums. We're seeing increases in uh, we're seeing increases in, in uh, deductibles. We're seeing increases in, in, in out of pocket costs on a, on, a, on a year to year basis, and it's eating up more of the average person's paycheck and making it more and more difficult to make ends meet. And then, and then in terms of, uh, and this also talks here about, about out-of-pocket expenditures. We are, this is, this has been rising significantly over the, over the, over the past uh, 20 years or so, and it is, it is only, only, get, only getting worse going forward. So what are some of the drivers of healthcare costs? What are the things that, uh, that cause this to go to, to get to the point where it is? Uh, and there are a number of contributing factors. So we have, there are, there are a couple of items I want to talk about dealing with population health. So we'll talk about high utilizers and, and, and disease trends in population health. We'll talk a little bit about emergency room utilization and, and how that is a driver for healthcare costs. We'll talk about medical malpractice and how that has, has to the extent that has, that has been an issue and the extent to which that has also change some practicing patterns in a way which may not be all that helpful for managing costs down the road. We'll talk a little bit about how about healthcare services are, are priced uh, within, our, within, our, within our system. And we'll also talk about prescription drug pricing, which has become an increasing, uh, uh, has become an increasing percentage of, of our rising healthcare costs. So let's talk a little bit about high utilizers. So what is a high utilizer, you might ask? It, what it, that essentially is, is if you look at what drives our healthcare costs, 20% 20, 20 of the patients in our healthcare system account for 80% of the healthcare costs. So these are the sickest people that we have. And in fact, about 10%, I think, account for about 70% of the healthcare costs. So if you, so a huge portion of the, um, the, 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 the folks who's uh, um, healthcare expenses need this kind of help are driving up these healthcare costs across the board. Now, who are these folks? Now, this is not, the, and so these are folks mainly with multiple chronic conditions. 
So you have things such as diabetes, COPD, congestive heart failure, hypertension, coronary artery disease, kidney failure. Um, um, a lot, some of these are brought on by, are brought on by lifestyle. Some of them are not. Uh, some of them are um, you know, just a person has a lot. It, it, they're just the condition they happen to find themselves in. This is not their fault, and it is uh, it may be a tempting thing to look at it as being that, but it, that is that that is that is not their fault at all. Uh, it is a fault of our system for how these how these folks' care is being managed. So I've talked to a lot of people over the years in terms of how to how to get at and how to how to manage these folks. And a consensus within the within the healthcare policy community is that once a patient gets into this cohort, once you get into that 20% cohort, there's not much that can be done for you because it's very, very difficult to pull you back into a more into a more reasonable cost pattern when you have more and more of these of these conditions. And the more likely you are to be a high utilizer is essentially if you if if you look at that list and if you have more than four if you have more than three or four of the conditions on that list, you are likely to either be or become a high utilizer. So a key component for our healthcare systems going forward is to identify these people and to and to and to work with them before they get into that cohort. So if you were to get one or two of these chronic conditions, you need uh, um, hospitals and healthcare systems need to step up their day-to-day -day interventions with patients so as to help them get to a point where they can better manage their health and they can get into a better place from the standpoint of their health before they, they escalate into becoming one of these high utilizers. Because once you've got over that proverbial cliff, it's very, very difficult to come back. So our, our job here is to uh, going forward from a population health perspective is to get is to get our system back to a point where we have fewer people who are either high utilizers or who are, who are at risk for becoming high utilizers and that and, and, and working with those folks going forward will be an important component to how we can keep health care costs under control and health high utilizers are typically not well served by our by our system so that um, they're they're as I mentioned they're associated with multiple health care visits, uh, multiple hospitalizations. They are heavy readmission risks. Um, I read a case of of a, of a of a gentleman in New Jersey a few years ago. He had 115 hospitalizations in one year, and you know I don't know about, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be in the hospital one day in a year, never mind 115 days in a year. Um, and here, this is some. This is this is a classic lose-lose scenario. He's, he's he's this person's in and out of hospitals constantly. His expenses are driving up insurance premiums and, and costs for everybody else. Hospitals are being penalized for readmission. They're being hit with readmission penalties, and the person himself has a terrible quality of life. I mean, could you imagine the kind of life you have if you're going to spend every you know one out of every three days in the hospital? Um, that's a, that is a terrible quality of life to, uh, for, um, for, for anybody. So nobody is being well served for, for having somebody who's in, who's in a situation like this. Another, another component for driving up healthcare costs is emergency room utilization. And in many cases, improper use of emergency rooms. And now one of the issues for, around when the, when the Affordable Care Act was being, was being pushed was that Uninsured people tended to rely upon emergency rooms because they didn't have a PCP, primary care physician, and that has certainly been true. Um, but we haven't seen, with the with the with the rise in the insured po in insured population that, that occurred at least at some point during during the ACA, it fell back a bit during the Trump years. It's been rising up again. Is that there still hasn't been a lot of change in the way emergency rooms have been utilized, or at least not from the data I've seen recently. Now, COVID. May have may have impacted that. COVID has been is it actually made state of comparability even more challenging because you have such a you have such a, a an odd period in there when all all the rules kind of went out the window. But you still see an, an issue of excessive reliance upon upon emergency rooms, and we do a very very poor job as a healthcare system in educating people as to when you should and when you should not go to an emergency room. Um, there are many conditions for whom either a follow up with a PCP or to go to, a, to or to go to a, a, uh, a lower cost urgent care or walking clinic would be um, a, a better use of 
a, a, a better better use of both your own time and of your own expenses. So, um, you know, I've seen some fleeting efforts to um, deal with this over over time. I was driving up the road coming into Providence one day. I saw some billboards basically basically describing you know you know when you should go to an emergency room and when you when you should go to an ED. I thought I, I, I'd love to get a picture of them and put them up here. I, thought, I actually thought they were kind of I thought they were kind of clever. Um, so, uh, and I, we need to do a better job of that. We need to educate people more in terms of when you really should go to an ED and when you, and when you should really go to an urgent care center. So if things like, if you're having, if you're having chest pains, if you have, uh, if you're having, you know, if you're concerned about chest pains or stroke or any of those catastrophic, catastrophic situations, by all means, get to the emergency room and get there as fast as possible. Um, there are others, there are other situations you see people in emergency rooms who, Probably should be cared for within 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 a a, um, a a local local clinic and not that high cost of an area. So so again here what we saw was and and, and uh, another part that, that that is that is driving people going to emergency rooms is that there is a shortage of PCPs and there has been continuing to be a shortage of PCPs out there. So. Some people are going to an emergency room, not because they want to go to an emergency room, but because they don't have access to a PCP that can, that can, that can, that can help them guide, they can help guide them, guide them through their own, uh, through this system. Um, or they, so, but, but there's still, it does, it does beg to the issue of education need, being needed to get people to um, a walk-in clinic as opposed to an emergency room if they don't have a PCP. Now another key another key driver of healthcare costs, uh, and this is talked about. I personally think it's talked about more than is warranted, but it is certainly something that is, that is out there, and that is medical malpractice. So you have you have allegations that have been made that that large patient lawsuits are driving up the cost of malpractice insurance, and, and resulting in physicians practicing defensive medicine. Now, I personally think that this is partly true. There have been increased litigation over over time, um, but some of that litigation was because of real, a lot of that litigation was because of real harm going on. Um, and there was a response in many states where medical malpractice cases had to be reviewed by an independent body before they were to go forward. So as to kind of put a, put a, put a, a put a, put a damper on the, the any kind of frivolous cases that might be that might be filed um but it still has resulted in in in, in physicians practicing more what would be called defensive medicine or if i could put air, air quote cya activity um so ordering more tests than is probably necessary in a, in a certain situation because they wanted to cover bases in case there was a there was a been kind of a legal issue down down the road this also does tend to tend does tend, tend to drive up costs it's not it's not it's, it's not even because of the, the numbers of, of malpractice suits going up it is because of the response to the threat of those suits going up and it's created a um, dynamic that is that has that has been an issue although it's not and, and, but you also, to, to the extent that anything needs to be done, needs to be addressed on this area, can't be can't be addressed in a way so that in which which results in a a patient not being able to get relief that they are deserved of and that and that and that is owed to them if there is in fact a legitimate medical malpractice situation. I had a I had a friend of mine who was who was on the receiving end of a, of, a, of, a, of a medical mal, malpractice incident. She, it, it, it almost killed her in a hospital. And that person should not be prevented from going forward with with legitimate relief upon it for a, for a legitimate case. So it's a balancing act in that respect. Uh, the next piece I wanted to talk about is uh, prescription prescription drug pricing. Uh, prescription drug pricing. Most prescription drugs in the United States are in fact much more exp expensive than their counterparts in other countries. Now there are a lot of reasons for this. You have other countries have more regulated pricing markets for, for drugs than, than we do. So because we don't, prescription drug companies are not only charging what they feel they can within the American market, but they are recouping, uh, they are actually recouping some of what they charge in the American market. Uh, what, 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 they're recouping what they cannot charge in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the foreign or in the overseas markets in the American market. So we are, so the American consumer could be argued to be paying for 
not only their drugs but for somebody else's drugs as well. And uh, so that has that that's an area that has to be has to be dealt with now. And and also because drug prices have been going up significantly, um, this is an area that's causing more and more pressure on health costs and more and more pressure on consumers. Now there has been some efforts recently. Um, by the Biden administration to get to start to get some kind of a handle on, on prescription drug costs, especially around insulin costs, which have been um, a particular issue over the last five, 10 years. Um, but and there have been and there have been other efforts to uh, control it uh, via the the uh, ability of the federal government to negotiate drug pricing with help with um, pharmaceutical companies around Medicare Part D. When Medicare Part D was first passed in the in the mid 2000s, uh, the government couldn't negotiate drug pricing. The the, the 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 drug companies literally dictated the price they were going to charge, and the federal government couldn't do anything about it. Um, and this this was a, a this was a hole that was closed in the most recent inflation inflation reduction act passed 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 in 2022 and signed by President Biden, which now now the federal government as a very large purchaser has the ability to negotiate those those prices. So the hope is that that will, in the longer term, force, force some of the prescription prices down because as, as they're not only are they dropping prices in the Medicare market, that would also necessitate dropping them in the commercial markets as well. Another key, another key component about the Medicare market is that because those are all, there are mostly older folks in those, in those areas, they have, they have higher needs. That is, um, that's that's a that could be a a, 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 a a an important curve to being being bent as far as the healthcare costs are concerned. So let's look at some of the other things that are using for pricing healthcare services. So there can, when it comes to a, to a to a service itself, there can be a, a huge discrepancies in what a, in what a healthcare provider can charge for a service. Uh, one common example is a colonoscopy. It can, can cost anywhere from fifteen hundred from about fifteen hundred dollars to almost five thousand dollars, depending on where you go and the circumstances and everything else. And this is basically the same person getting getting the same service. And it is it is very very difficult for the average healthcare consumer to navigate and understand. Where to go in terms of get in terms of getting getting uh, getting healthcare costs? I have I have my iPhone sitting right here. I can get more information on pricing or or reviews or anything else around my iPhone or an Android or anything else than I than I can if I if I if I needed to get a colonoscopy or if my or if or if someone needed to get um, a uh, mammogram or uh, or or a, um, a PCA test or anything like that. These things can be very, very difficult to, to track down, very, very difficult to understand. There's also a mindset that you see among consumers, people who have the, for the, the, the bulk of people who have insurance coverage, there is a mindset of people saying, well, insurance is gonna pay for it, so it doesn't, ma I don't, it, it doesn't matter to me as much. And it is, it is more difficult to get people to understand that, but we also don't give them the tools to be able to manage, man manage their costs on that, even as, the uh, proliferation of high deductible plans has been going up, and this is these are some some comparisons of drug prices um, for the the, the uh, American American market vis-a-vis -vis other other markets, and you can see um, Crestor. Um, we have about it, it can go from two hundred and twenty dollars to down forty dollars in the rest of the world. Savaldi. Um, you, you're seeing a huge, huge discounts. Adivir, Genuvia, these are all drugs that are massively more expensive in the American market than you'll see in, in, you'll see in, in, in other markets around the world. So there are um, there are two additional videos that I have in this uh, for this week. There's a, there's a PBS uh, video about why the U.S. pays more more for healthcare, and there's also a um, another another. Um, a view from Vox as to why healthcare is so expensive, and those are those are items I would encourage you to take a look at. And then we have our discussion topic this week is on healthcare costs. And in your in your perspective, what do you think is the most important thing to address to control healthcare costs? And again, keep keep in mind that the uh, discussion discussion guidelines. I expect to see uh, good good thoughts and uh, and ideas on that. And please don't forget to respond to other other people's posts as well. So. 
I look forward to reading your thoughts on this and I will be speaking to you soon. Thank you.